Hello and welcome. It is my pleasure today to introduce to our Lokwani audience, Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam, who is the president of STIMS Institute, which is an advisory consulting and mentoring service organization that partners with businesses and universities around the world. He is a distinguished fellow of two professional societies, ASME and SME. He has had a distinguished professional career and has received the coveted Eugene Merchant Medal for Manufacturing. He has been widely published for his professional work. He's also a philanthropist who is the president of ASE, American Association for Social Advance Advancement of India, which is a nonprofit organization. He parallelly has delved deep into spirituality and has written three books. His uh, latest book is Spirituality in Practice, Exploration for Peace and Harmony Within Us, as well as Collaboration and Cohesiveness with all that surrounds us. Dr. Krishnamurti, what a pleasure, or as you are referred to as Subhu, welcome to Lokwani. Namaste. Namaste, uh, Dr. Anjali. Thank you very much. <laughs> what a pleasure it is, and uh, what an amazing um, life you have had. I shouldn't just say career, because you have done three different things. You know, had a very, very successful professional career, which you continue um, along with things in philanthropy and now spirituality. So of course, I would be very interested to know um, how did this engineer who is a PhD from MIT start getting interested and delve deep into spirituality? Actually, thank you very much, uh, Anthony. It has been a delightful journey and life experience. Uh, when I came to MIT as a graduate student 50 years ago, in 1972, I had the privilege to organize lecture halls for Swami Chinmayananda's lectures at the request of the local community and as part of the Sangam Indian Student Club. That gave me an opportunity to listen to Swamiji's talk, and that was the beginning of my introduction to the studies and learning of Vedic philosophy. When I listened to his talks, some of them resonated very well, but some of them came across as metaphysical are not so clear to me. So I continued my studies, and thanks to that initiation by Swami Chinmayananda, I am where I am today. The second part of my journey has been, I've been blogging on this topic of spirituality for the last 10 years yeah. under the site spiritualityinpractice.com. And that evolved into 200 essays, and some people then suggested, why don't I combine that into a book? The third has been a, another equally personal and very joyful experience of having a weekly discussion session under the title of Jnana Yoga with a group of people online, which also has helped us to tell into various uh, chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Atma Bodha, uh, Nirvana Shatakam, Kathopanishad, and many other scriptures. All of these have helped me to put this information together into this book that you just mentioned about spirituality in practice. That is amazing, uh, Subhusar, really, wow. <laughs> How much you have read. I mean, I think the Hindu scriptures, I mean, there's a ocean out there and it's amazing how much you have swum in that ocean and uh, also I, I was thinking about this uh, that particular talk by Swami Chinmayananda you know so many people have told me how uh, life-changing it was and I know these people have contributed tremendously um, especially the establishment of the Chinmaya Center in Boston which has become you know quite a center for uh, you know transmission of uh, enlightening knowledge around uh, the country and so many people were affected and I'm glad to hear that your journey also started there. Um, so now, of course, you know, one of the questions that keeps coming up is, you know, this word spirituality and religion, are they the same? Are they different? Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, absolutely. Actually, that is one of the biggest challenges we have. Uh, most people think of spirituality as something for old age or something to do with religion or something for afterlife or something like that, or we can finish a career and then look into spirituality and so forth. To me, they are kind of a, a misconceptions of the reality. Yeah. In fact, we are all spiritual all the time, according to Vedic philosophy. We are all children of immortality, says Veda, 
the Upanishad, which means spirituality is like breathing. You begin with spirituality right from the beginning and you end with spirituality at the end of the journey of your life. And the spirituality as such continues as part of the universe as a whole. So how do we then distinguish between religion and spirituality? Say religion is usually a set of codes and guides, a set of beliefs and set of rituals that a group of people follow for self-discipline and for reassurance, especially at times of concern and crisis. Spirituality goes one step beyond that to say why those rituals exist, why those guidelines exist, how do one develop self-discipline on one's own accord based on self-reflection, which is called analysis or yoga, internal reflection, which leads us to understand that there is a form and framework and a methodology to everything that exists in the universe. And it's not just a random occurrence that what it is that we call as life. And that way of thinking, that way of self-reassurance based on knowledge and understanding of what things are, how it is, helps us also to understand what is life, what's the given situation we are in, how to deal with that with a greater level of objectivity and less subjectivity. And also greater faith in the laws of nature, which is called Brahman, which gives us an anchor around which we are able to cope with anything. So in some respects, spirituality is like dealing with the ocean waves on the top and also the deep ocean at the bottom that sustains all the waves. And the two of them coexist. Similarly, our life with all its ups and downs is the way it's, it is. But underneath that is a spiritual content that supports all the activities of life. And one he sees both these sides is able to manage life with a greater degree of peace, equanimity, harmony, and collaboration within oneself, in which they become their own friend, but also able to collaborate and cohesively exist with everything and everyone around us. That's what real spirituality is all about. Yeah, but, but would you say that, you know, the uh, often people tell you that, right, to get to that point that you got to with self-reflection and all of that, religion is a good pathway to that, to have the tradition. So what importance do you think religious practices have along the way as to when you, by the time you get to spirituality of self-reflection and all of that, that you were talking about? See, any process of self-discipline is the first step towards becoming more spiritual in our outlook. So self-discipline can come from religion and religious practices. It can also come from the social engagement with other people involved. So we, be, we begin to feel we are not alone. We are part of a community. In those aspects, religion is very useful. But our education, the analytical methods that we have in school and colleges, the way a researcher looks at everything objectively. A professional who looks at every patient, for example, every doctor looks at every patient with a level of non-attachment. This non-attachment, objectivity, analytical reasoning are equally important to be spiritual. So yes, religion gives a certain guidelines for self-discipline, but the mental conditioning also comes from our approach for self-reflection, analysis, um, objectivity and non-attachment, which is what we all learn. We all learn at school students, we all learn at professors, we all teach as professors, we all practice as professionals in any field. We also practice as parents, we also practice as care, taking care of elders. So this non-attachment, objectivity, and a reflection of the bigger picture, which is really what spirituality is all about, can be practiced with religion, but it can also be practiced as a parallel to and independent of religion and religious practices. That, that, that's beautiful. Um, but of course, it seems like the, you do need some guides, you know, it's, uh, and again, oftentimes we hear today is, um, you know, we are very busy currently and this time for self-reflection or spirituality doesn't exist. Um, what advice do you have? I mean, you yourself had a very, very busy and fulfilling professional career. So what advice would you have for a professional today uh, who might come and say, hey, you know, the spiritual nonsense is not for me? Yeah, I think the first thing they have to start by thinking is spirituality is not nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it, it is like breathing. 
So can somebody say, I want to live but without breathing? <laughs> Obviously, that uh, doesn't work. Yeah. Similarly, spirituality is a way of thinking, a way of conditioning our mind. Now, as human beings, we have body, mind, and intellect. The intellect is the one that needs to be conditioned in order to get the best out of our body and our mind. Spirituality gives us a way to do that. If you do it, the body and mind, we get better use of it. If you don't do it, we still will be using body and mind, but with lesser efficiency or with greater turbulence, greater uh, perturbations of life, anxiety, so on and so forth. So to say that I'm busy and hence I don't have time for reflection and thinking, it's really not a, it's only a, what should I say, a sort of a self-conceived, self-defeating thought process. Mm. Uh, for example, right now, right here, you can sit down and imagine a beautiful river, you know, or a lot of Ganges, or a temple, or a beautiful feast, anything you can imagine within a fraction of a second, and your whole mind is full of that. So the same mind can be used for an intellectual reflection on, why am I subjective or am I objective? How do I know that? And why am I like this? And how do I look at it from a degree of detachment as opposed to getting wound up in that? All these things can happen in fractions of a second. Yeah. So to say that I'm busy and hence I don't have spiritual time for spirituality really suggests something like saying, being in the soccer field, but I don't know how to kick the ball. <laughs> I love that. I really love that a lot. Um, and I think what you're saying is that if there are these techniques that are given to make you more efficient, to make you sense of the world that you live in so that you will be more productive in what you do uh, and you do whatever you're doing much better. And I think I've heard that from every single angle that people who practice self-reflect, you know, and do those kinds of things have a, a better and more fulfilling life overall. Um, and I know that your book, uh, in your book uh, that you have published recently, you have given a lot of um, tips. Actually, could you tell us a little bit about that book and uh, why you would recommend uh, people to read it? And, you know, what do you hope they will get out of it? Um, I hope people will buy and read the book. I will also tell you, it, it's not easy to, read, to pick up a topic like spirituality in practice and start reading it because it looks, as you just said, foreign, alien, or not time for that, and so forth. But this book is written in a very simple way. It is written as a collection of uh, essays. Uh, first, we start with a series of questions, some of which you just asked. What is spirituality? Is it same as religion? Is it different from religion? Why do I need spirituality in a busy life? All these questions we addressed in the very beginning of the book. Then we have five essays which are like contemplative and reflective. For example, you can look at a lamp at your home and look at the components of the lamp and think about the how that relates to you as a person. A stable lamp, a volatile oil, a transforming wick, and the glow of the lamp, which is really the phenomena which you cannot capture, but you can only understand and appreciate through your cognitive senses. All the things you can understand by just looking at the lamp. So like that, we go with five essays, simple essays, to introduce the concept of analytical thinking required for philosophy and spirituality. Then we go into a set of 22 essays, which are each short one, anywhere from six pages to eight pages long, that goes into every aspect of Vedic philosophy, including some brief uh, uh, four or five page summary of uh, Bhagavad Gita, two or three page summary of Atma Bodha, one or two pages summary of Kathopanishad, and also we give some nice models and some pictures and I, because they're all analytical. So the models and illustrations are easy for us to follow. So they are also in there. After that, we follow with another 49 essays where we show how the application of this uh, principles of Vedic philosophy can be applied in daily life. Again, with extensive references to Bhagavad Gita verses as appropriate in various places. For example, one verse in Bhagavad Gita that is very, very appealing to me, it says, through self-reflection and self-control, a person remains as one's own friend. Absence of self-reflection and self-control, one becomes one's own worst enemy. <laughs> so if you want a friend or an enemy, don't look outside of you. Just look at your own thoughts and the objectivity behind it and how are you looking at it in a detached manner that itself 
elevates you to become a good friend for yourself. As soon as you become a good friend, you also become a better friend for everybody around you. The cohesiveness and the harmony begins to expand. That, that's, that's really amazing. So you're saying that even though the book is covering a vast number of topics, you can really break it down into little units and um, study it as, as on an as-needed basis, you know, and uh, slowly you can um, tackle those questions that you might seek answers to. So that, that's really fantastic. And I know that it's a really um, a very reasonably priced book. And uh, I think one of the things that uh, we talked about, you and I, Sabu, is that this might make a great gift to give to people, especially young people who are maybe starting out their careers or you know giving it a, a, off as a gift because um, it's very, very reasonably priced. I know you're not doing it um, you know, to collect money, but to really spread the word. So really recommend uh, people to do that. I, I really like that idea a lot. And uh, one of the things, another thing that you told me is that uh, the book has a lot of, and I think you quoted a few here, you use examples extensively. And I think uh, there was that idea of that two-sided coin that you talked about in the book. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, excellent. Sure, sure, Ranjani. Actually, this concept of two-sided coin evolves out of Vedic philosophy. You study more and more, you begin to understand that. Essentially, anything you can think of, anything can relate to, or anything that exists is like a two-sided coin. On one side is cognitive that we can relate to. It can be atom to molecule, to our human body, to our body, mind, and emo intellect, our emotions, our analytical reasoning, the planet, the universe, whatever you can recognize, relate to, that is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the enabler, the laws of nature, which makes things happen. For gravity, magnetism, uh, electromagnetic forces that make our brain to work, or our heart to pump, or any aspect of any science, medical, material science, anything. They're all enabled by infinite and innumerable laws of nature, which you can relate to only by looking at their evidences. And that infinite, invisible, eternal, objective, omnipresent laws of nature, there's a single word that Vedic philosophy uses called Brahman. So on one side is the Brahman, the enabler. The other side is all the enabled. We can also call it like Purusha and Prakriti, or soul and uh, or Atman and the Deham, and the body, uh, and things like that. So this very simple concept of looking at anything as a two-sided coin helps us to understand, am I looking at the cognitive side or am I ignoring the incognitive, which either I understand through my studies and so forth, or I have a faith in because, or I seek others who know the knowledge about it and I go and ask them more about to better understand my cognitive side. So that's really what Vedic philosophy tells us as a methodology. For example, French philosopher says, uh, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. I am. What Vedic philosophy says is, I am, therefore I think. That's it. That's it. <laughs> really beautiful. So uh, what I'm hearing from you is that uh, as you delve into the Vedas, uh, there is so much for even though it was written, I don't know, millions of years ago or thousands of years ago, uh, there's so much that is relevant for every day today. Uh, and that's what you have tried to capture in your book. And I think that's very, very interesting. Uh, what has been the response to your book? Have young people read it? Have people liking it? Could you repeat that question? Oh, I said, uh, 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 what has been the response to your book? Have young people read it? And what have they felt about the book? Well, actually, the people who have read it have all given me very positive and very appreciative feedback, and I appreciate that. And that includes young people as well as those uh, who are not all that young, like me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But at the same time, it's also difficult to get the message across because of the questions you asked earlier. Because people think of this topic as something not for me, not for, right. for somebody else or for some other time. Right. The other thing also is that we are conditioned by thinking that all as you said, the Vedas and uh, scriptures are all for people with a monastic background or with religious background. Only those people can teach us, only those people can learn, or those people can understand and practice. But are they somehow related to rituals? We have to get over that mindset 
we have to try to get over that mindset, I believe, because once we do that, then I think more people will, I hope they do, because at the end of the day, analytical reasoning is what we all of us yeah. try to teach our children through education. That's yeah. what we try to practice as professionals. Then why is it then we cannot bring the same thing to study and understanding of the Vedic philosophy to our daily life? That's our challenge. That's my our should be our goal. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think the Vedic philosophy was given not for you know some monk to read in his cave, but really for living life. I mean, Bhagavad Gita talks about that all the time, and it was given on the battlefield as people were trying. I mean, Arjuna could have said, "I don't have time," but he had the time, and that's what it made it so beautiful and so um, impactful. Um, and I think a very, very good point that you bring up. Um, and well, I, I think. Matter, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to have said. Oh, sorry for that. Mad Krishna could have said, "I don't have time for it. Just go fight." <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you later, but do it now. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but which is, yeah, which is what we as parents try to do to our children. <laughs> Very good point you bring up, and I think in general, uh, maybe I'll ask. I think you have touched upon it in your books that uh, you know everything that is in the Vedic uh, philosophy is very useful for managers, right? As they are trying to, uh, you know, run large companies, and uh, I know that you have run large groups. Do you have any thoughts to share on that as well? Yeah, exactly. See, again, every manager has to be objective in the making the decisions. If they may, if they're objective, and thereby detached from the subject matter and look at it for what it is appropriate, the decision that they made would be the same, whether it is they are the manager or anyone else is the manager. And once they make the decision, that is the best decision that can be made. So in that sense, they have a peace of mind and they're also willing to change their mind at any time with the new evidence, if uh, they become their objective and they're not attached to any one set of views, they're not biased or ignorant of certain other things that could exist. They're open and honest to anybody. Everyone is accessible to them. The door is always open because they're objective and uh, they're not attached to anything specific. So everyone feels at home with them. On top of it, they're focused on the fundamental principles, the incognitive, the enablers. The as such then, everything is going to happen only based on the incognitive, you know, the enablers, the Brahman. So if once they're focused on that, that's the best that they can do as a professional. So all these basic things we talk about are very much applicable for management. management. And on top of it, every management aspect has got two dimensions to it. One is power, the other is uh, knowledge. The, the, there is another dimension to it that is internal, that is what I know and how I feel, and the other is external, how I influence others and how do I be able to get things to, to them. So either way you look at the dimensions, either knowledge or power, or internal or external, both of them require self-reflection and management of the mind in a very precise, well-tuned manner. And spirituality is nothing more than that. Beautiful, beautiful. I see, I see the absolute impact of uh, you know all studying all this, especially for busy managers. I think that that makes a lot of sense for them to be more effective in what they do. Um, so anyway, this has been really, really enlightening. Do you have any special message for our readers? Uh, well, uh, in addition to that, what I would like to say is, even though we described it in words so far, there are several pictures that are very, very illustrative and some models, so which are easy to follow So in the book. So I hope uh, people will get the book and look at it. The way I tell people is don't read from cover to cover like a novel, but instead, after you buy a book, go through it from, skip through it from beginning to end as if you're going to buy the book in a bookstore. <laughs> then you look at the pictures and images. Then you look at the list of uh, uh, topics in the table of contents because the topic themselves will be very provocative and appealing to you. There are several topics like the burden of relationship or things like... Uh, uh, the unflickering lamp at the altar. What does it tell us? Symbolism of home. There are many such topics. Or when you're flying in the sky, where is the stop sign? Uh, or what do you do when you see a turtle on the road? <laughs> so, so like that. So I hope they will look at any one of those topics and read it. But this itself would have taken them about a month. Have a discussion with the people around you, your colleagues, your friends, your family. So let it be a 
some life experience, shared experience of an across all of you. Once that process is gone, then slowly take the time to read one essay at a time in any sequence you like. And this might take about a year. So for a $20 to buy a book, you'll be engaged for an assignment, for a year long assignment, <laughs> which in my opinion, I, and I also my prayer, will be life changing experience for a lot of people. The final thought I like to give also, Ranjani, is there are lots of people who do good things in their life. For example, there are people who are taking care of their parents, uh, our elders, our children, our spouse, or someone who is not so healthy. And then they feel the self-doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Or they're bothered by someone else who comes and says some random thing. Why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Or some other the family member saying, you could have done it better, they say, or that way. So then get disabled, they get upset, perturbed. While they're doing the good things in their life, then instead of smelling the roses, seeing the glasses half full, and then going on to adding more to it, they get destabilized. They feel like a cart with a wheel broken. They don't have to feel like that. Self-control, self-discipline, spiritual outlook is a way to change that. And hopefully this book will be a starting point for them to get such a framework such an anchor for their own joyful life in life, no matter what they do. Because all of us by our very nature are spiritual, very good, very joyful. And we want to give that to other people around us. We just try our best to do it, but without a methodology or without a framework. And hopefully this book will give some framework for them. That is really profound because I know that uh, there are many who are caring for elders, and of course, there are many, of course, children are part of our lives and uh, women often feel torn, you know, between all their uh, different, uh, you know, demands that are there on them and uh, feel burdened by it, feel uh, sometimes overwhelmed by it, uh, men and women. And um, I think that's a very, very good point that you bring up, uh, uh, you know, that this could really help them get a perspective on that as well. So wonderful, Subhasa. Thank you for taking the time to write it. I know writing a book is not a joke and uh, to share it so extensively, you know, that is really speaks of your generosity. You know, you knew a lot, but to be able to share that is, is a lot of work and uh, thank you for putting the time. And, um, you know, we will have the QR code on the video uh, linked to the uh, book itself. And so we hope uh, our readers will be motivated to buy the book. And as I said, not just them, you know, it might be a great gift to give to people. Now you're saying even to those who are perhaps burdened by, you know, elder care or, you know, other care that they are doing as well. So wonderful, Subhu sir. Thank you for, you know, all that you have done in your life. We truly appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to speak to Lokwani. Namaste. Thank you very much, Chanjani. Really, you're very kind and gracious. And it's all the blessings in life. And uh, one of my blessings is to get to know you as part of my life. Oh, and vice versa, sir, and vice versa. Thank you so much. Mangalam Shivam.